from Mary Shelley's Frankenstein to the Lucas and Roddenberry franchises, the Martian Chronicles, and beyond. Science fiction is undeniably a part of our culture. But what exactly is science fiction? And how do you write a science fiction novel? This series will attempt to answer those questions. Welcome, everybody, back for a brand new episode of Science Fiction with Kate and Adam. It's the first one of the year, and I'm excited. I think uh, in, in terms of renewal, hey, it's, uh, it's a new year. And uh, the hard work on building out and developing the novel is going to continue. And we're going to get some updates, and we're going to keep everybody on track, holding us all accountable to what's happening here. So um, I'm going to start and pick on Kate first, because our good Fred Adam is is having a bit of a, a struggle, which, you know, he can talk about a little bit later. Hawaii. Is that a struggle? No. <laughs> yeah, I'm a surfer now. I just surf all day, man. So, but You're I missing can, you know, some I've, flow up top to I'm be a surfer, dude. For inspiration, so... Do you, do you think that that the flow, right, the, the change in uh, just the change in atmosphere, uh, I mean, like landscape and space and, you know, it's what a vacation's for. Does that, that change your, uh, you know, how you're writing or what you're writing or? You know, I had ambitions of coming down here and doing like just writing, like, you know, in the evenings with a drink and, and uh it's funny. It's like when you're busy, you're doing the things. And then when you're on vacation, you're not doing anything. You don't want to do anything. So it, it didn't help at all, <laughs> I would say. Um, it, you know, it was kind of like an all or nothing. But now that I'm stuck here for another two weeks, um, yeah, I think I might just dive into this uh, a, a lot more than usual. I really want to push this forward. This is like a bright beacon in terms of on my radar right now. I want to, I just want to write my ass off for the next couple of months and push this thing. So, but we're, bigger words have been spoken. So we'll see. Yeah. We'll see what, what, what falls out and uh, mm -hmm. you know, how it, how it develops. No, I'm excited. And it's uh, you know, that's really a lot of what the writing process is about. So um, Kate, what is, where's your inspiration pulling you into the new year here? Um, what are your thoughts? It, uh, I mean, I kind of can reiterate that exact same thing. It had great ambitions over all the holidays. Like, oh, I might have some days where I could just write. And between three colds that went through our family, like in cycles, obviously everybody gets it. You know, we can all just get it at once. No, no, no. We have to spread it out. Um, I'm still at home now with the kid, just finishing off the third round of that. And then the holidays and travel. And I went to Ontario for some work. Um, and luckily, despite all of the spikes, this just common cold stuff. But I didn't even get to touch it. And you know what? I was just going to, in the private chat here, I'm going to be fully vulnerable and admit I don't even remember where the link is to start editing or writing. So Adam, I'm going to just need you to resend that to me. I, I mean, I would like to say that I failed epically, but I don't think I did. I just didn't get to do it. And uh, I got to give myself forgiveness. It's okay. But I agree with Adam. I'm super excited to jump back in and start writing. And even him and I were talking about so what happened in the news, Adam? Uh, yeah, Montreal is just, uh, they're threatening to um, put um, extra healthcare charges on people that don't get vaccinated. And if you recall, part of our plot line of, of our novel was that uh, this individual is not following the healthcare guidelines and therefore gets kicked out of the system. So, like, huh. That's simultaneously terrifying and um but not that far off. Yeah. Oh. So uh -huh. you know <laughs> and, I mean it's so funny because I, I now I'm like, oh, we're writing this stuff and it's it's supposed to be sci-fi, but is it? Yeah. 
is it? We are not that far off. Like there's so much, so much that's precedent that's being set by this current situation, right? That it, it's a little scary. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've always been an advocate of um, making the the creation process more um, efficient, I would say. So I don't know if we can do it at this particular point in time. I really don't. But but the idea is that let's imagine the book was uh, with a publisher. OK, they are launching it. And Kate and Adam knock on the door of the publisher and say, do you know what's happening in Montreal? OK, something similar. Wouldn't it be nice to have uh, some sort of a uh, marketing piece, communication piece, video, something that has already been formed, created, ready for that moment? Or even now to help, you know, get the attention and get that thing moving. That's valid. It's valid. I like it. You know? And and I, I don't know how to galvanize or put that together. I mean, it, it you know, we have three smart people in this room. Um, you know, what does it look like? But it, it, it looks something like that's in the news. That's in the news. And here's our novel. I mean, very simple. Right. I mean, you know, it takes a little bit of storyboarding on a, uh, on a on a marketing piece. But, you know, if you do that in conjunction with the, the writing process, then you you have built audience, you have built the pieces, um, you know, that go along with all the important segments, right? Rather than after the fact, well, well, how do we market this? And, you know, how do we build content? And how do we, you know, this kind of thing. So um, that's just an idea. I don't, I don't know what the next steps are for that. Uh, but, you know, you're right, you guys, like, that's, a, a really important thing and it's simultaneously scary and it's somehow seeping into our reality <laughs> yeah mm. yeah I, I i don't like it <laughs> to be, you know, it's not uh it doesn't feel like the place i grew up you know when i look around right now just the, the way people are being treated, the, 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 the way people are treating each other, the way people are treating each other, it's just not a nice. It's not. It's not the Canada. I, you know, and, and I never even realized I had an identified definition of Canada in my head until I recognized that I didn't see it anymore. So, wow. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what else to say about that. But it is coming out in the novel. It is part of the reality and it's a main theme uh, within the reality. Uh, mm -hmm. And I'm trying to think, is it, does it have other implications beyond the health, beyond healthcare? Well, we, um, so last time, Caitlin, you missed the last couple, but we were talking about the litigation piece, right? So one of the stressors, right. like I had got into the character's first day and like stressors are coming in and then boom, he gets hit with a litigation. And we were talking about how litigation in the future is just be like really AI bots pulling information, making a decision and you have no choice. It's just, it's done. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and then Dan and I were talking about big data. And we're like, well, wouldn't it be cool if we took the minority report spin on this and say that like your litigation was like a pattern of behavior was detected on behalf of you here's your your correction fine uh, because we predict that you're going to do so you're fine for something you haven't done yet if we thought that maybe that's a cool place to play a little bit um just to in this world of worlds of, of ones and zeros that's kind of interesting i like that but you know what i would be really pissed off if i got a fine for something i didn't do yet but if the technology is such that like like you're being fed so much information to get a warning that says, Hey, you're predisposed. Be careful. Don't make this decision. But that would be into your risk assessment too, right? Like we would be putting programming risk tolerances into our decision-making 
at some mm-hmm. point. So it'd be kind of, and actually I, when I, when I wrote it, I had this whole bit about like, you know, it's very cold the characters. Like I hate these things. They always piss me off and ruin my day because I have no choice. I just show up and they get handed like a, a slap on the wrist or something. I'm not even sure what's going on, but what right? I thought was, was cool. And I haven't fully explored it as I was writing it. I was like, well, maybe this is kind of a cool spot where, um, you know, maybe there's some funny business going on in the, in the company. So, like, the, the protocol actually detected something that this character didn't know about, right? We were talking about kind of, kind of build conflict within, within this business. Um, so, I thought, you know, this could be like uh, building, um, alluding to something going on. You know? Mm-hmm. It might be a, Interesting. I like it. Of, kind of play with that. I mean, there's not a whole lot of conflict we have to build in the business necessarily, I think, because it's just the fact that like the whole concept, right, is that when everything is auto-generated and you're like, it's this concept of good is the biggest impediment to great, right? We've defined what our projections are. We're meeting our projections. We're doing this and we're, we're making these decisions all based on those projections and this risk tolerance. And we're being told by the, the system exactly the decision we need to make in order to make those profits. We're doing great. You're now like there's zero innovation. There's zero engagement. It's not a people's decision. It's profit decisions based only. Like that in itself is like, you know, it's a problem. Right, because you lose the creativity, you lose the innovation, you lose the engagement. That's that to me in this business is the biggest epiphany moment. Right, I don't know if we need necessarily a whole bunch of corruption. I don't, I don't want to miss this point in our in our book. Right, oh, I don't know good, how much point. add in. Mm-hmm. Can I make? make a suggestion on urgency because this is um kate it's a it's a rock solid point it really is uh and the way the world works is different than sometimes the way you want to project it in a in in a book so what i what i want to see is a sense of urgency so like imagine let's take it out of your story so to give you guys an objective standpoint let's say somebody wants to write a story about uh you know a, a some girls and you know young kids decide to make a trip out to the coast. Okay, and they're so it's such a transformative trip. They say, you know what? Let's make a screenplay out of this. Okay, you need to have some urgency. You need to have some conflict and urgency in there. Okay, um, so in in your situation, uh, or actually to use the situation about the coast, they have to get out there. They have to get you know, their application submitted to the college by this particular time, or they have to do this by this time. There has to be something that makes that person the protagonist, that makes somebody rooting for them to get to their goal, right? So let's, so Kate's already identified what, you know, the, something that, that she really, really wants to entrench. So now how do we build some urgency around that? Yeah. Okay. We haven't written that scene yet. <laughs> it's urgent. <laughs> it's urgent. Write it. <laughs> oh, I love it. Um, yeah. No, I can totally appreciate that. Oh, well, see, the, see the where it goes, right? Like, I think I think we started with it. Like when our character um, has that meeting to become partner, right? I think we we talked about that scene where he's meeting with one of the partners who's kind of mentoring him and they meet in this virtual cafe. I think there's this urgency, like you're supposed to be moving up the ladder. You're supposed to be doing these things, like just follow the system. Mm. And he's like really struggling internally with just following the system and that good is good enough. And just like, take the path, take the easy path, like put in your time. Like, why, why are you trying to, to fight the system like <laughs> you can succeed if you just follow these rules and i think he's kind of like yeah i guess i should follow this pill right and and i you know it sets him on this path of health destruction he's not living his ek guy you know 
Uh, and so he ends up, I guess, like, there's a little bit of urgency there to get into the system and a little sort of, uh, I guess, he had to swallow a piece of himself in order to do that and kind of put it away. Um, I'm just trying to think of where we would plug in the urgency. Like he has that health episode. He's been hijacked. He goes to another planet where he under gets entrenched into a whole new culture of, of people and caring and what can be built that way. Then to come back, that's probably where the sense of urgency is. It's like, I can't do this anymore. Right. Like I can't. Yeah. I'm so I think I think there has to be like a set almost a second epiphany, right? Of like he comes back, he finally gets plugged back in after being out on the edge and doing all this stuff. He can he finally thinks he gets his life back. And it's this epiphany of I don't want this. Like I've I've I'm self-aware now, right? Like I'm so self-aware I can't do this. I literally cannot. Play by the by those rules again. Okay, um, I like that. Uh, I, I I can relate, and I've heard of uh, some cultural adaptation stories of people. Uh, I can think of somebody I won't name names, but you know, spent a lot of time in a different culture, and then had to move back. And it was in South America, so there's a different way of life. And um, when it's new and novel. It's interesting. You can adapt to it when you have to return to it and then, you know, kind of integrate back into it. It's like, ah, this is. This doesn't feel good, you know, yeah. and. Uh, I think one of the things that you could consider as an idea uh, to, to bring up that alter ego is to introduce competition because isn't adapting to the system predicated on a competition model. Yeah. And so. Somebody maybe younger, prettier, handsomer, whatever. Handsomer. That's a really good word. We put that one in there. <laughs> handsomer. <laughs> oh. But you have you have this like, you know, the 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 the, the character is saying, I can't do this. But now the weight, okay, is to is to create something uh to show leadership to break through that and into something that does replicate, that is, you know, kind of that breakthrough moment. And what's the urgency? Well, the guy or girl behind him that's going to take his position and is coming up fast and furious and is just really ready to do all the things that, that, that he's not able to do. Well, okay. I love this. Okay. So I think mm -hmm. that when he, when he got, cut off right you remember that moment he got cut off he's going out he automatically gets a temp partner assigned and they're just following the system they're doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing there's no like friction like they're just so they really accelerate it uh, while he's on his leave his health leave right mm -hmm. they're doing great and now he comes back and to take over almost like a mat leave right now you don't have that position anymore it was a temporary position but he's struggling with it and they're not getting the results because he's not just following the program. And so, yeah, there's this competition of this person who did so well, but they're technically not supposed to be in that role and all this stuff. So, yeah, I love it. I love it. There's definitely going to be that competition when he comes back, right? Because who filled his spot when he left? Yeah. Well, I think there's an interesting commentary there on, on different career paths, right? Like the corporate ladder versus uh, maybe an entrepreneurial path or an artistic path or something along those lines right and not to say one is is you know better or worse than the other um but there are maybe behaviors or types of people that might be attracted to one or the other right and that's kind of interesting right now because i feel as though a lot of people are reevaluating which path they have chosen right now plus this like great resignation thing right i'm gonna try the other path Grass is looking greener. So, an interesting comparison there. We can draw. Hmm. Yeah. So I, you know, I'm I'm in agreement, you guys. That's an interesting. It does make the the complexity of building characters and introducing them, you know, a little bit more complex. 
Um, and, you know, I don't know where your intuition lies in terms of maybe maybe putting it as more of a linear process to get them through the book and build build the process and then introduce more complexity afterwards, right? Because there's going to be multiple drafts. We don't have to... Sometimes when you're writing, if you build too much complexity into it right away, it can just, it, you can lose that, you know, main track of where things are going. So, you know, the other option is to say, well, you know, we don't have to introduce so much conflict right away because, you know, we can, we could do it later, but be prepared for more substantial rewrites because a conflict is like a clothesline. And as soon as you establish that conflict, things just naturally start hanging on it. Okay, mm -hmm. storyline starts just falling into place because resolving that contract, that conflict. What are all the things that step that go in the way of actually, you know, stopping that from the protagonist making their goal? It's like they're just rooting for that protagonist to make their goal. Mm -hmm. And you know, so if you had something like a very cute little girl that was sitting on mommy's lap then it's actual blissful. It doesn't, you know, there's nothing else to talk about. The book would sell just right like that, right? But if you had something that was a little bit different um, and you're, you know, you're trying to have the main character question how unfair reality is, uh, how uh, abrasive reality is, um, how do you resolve that? It, 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 it's so massive and so big. You'd almost have to be like the evil genius and go, I'm going to take over the world. And here's my plan. <laughs> you know, like, how do you fix everything? And is really the protagonist the antagonist? And is really the person in the competition actually the emerging protagonist? Who's overcoming what? Because even though the person's benefit, like they're, they're, um, you know, they're good, right? Um, you know, what are they trying to achieve? What are they overcoming? Are they just very nihilistically saying society sucks? <laughs> right? Well, life sucks sometimes. And then right behind you on your heels is that whippersnapper that's coming in to just, you know, but... In their eyes, they're the protagonist. Their sure. obstacle is you, who thinks I need to change everything. Yeah, I I wonder if because we have this starts off a little bit more complex, right? There's all different characters, there's interactions, there's life, right? And then it kind of takes a turn, you know, in that scene that Caitlin wrote, where all of a sudden now it's going to be it's like one character's experience going on an adventure. So I think simplifies there for a second right um so i suspect as we go through it the beginning part will take a lot of rewrites like add this character delete that character combine these characters that doesn't make sense or that's cool but it doesn't add right like i think that part you're right i think is gonna evolve considerably as the rest of the story progresses hmm. Is, okay. is fuzzier in my mind. Right. Too many things in the so, blender, so to speak. Yeah. So, Adam, where are you at right now? Like, if you, um, this would just answer this question. Where in the novel are you thinking to jump into if you had to write right after this, uh, you know, this, this, this meeting? I like, right. In the beginning, I'm trying to establish what this person's day is like. So I'm at that difficult part where there's characters coming and going and, and, and whatever. But I think I'm not going to worry too much about getting it perfect. I just want to kind of set the stage. I'm, I'm trying to build to the, uh, the health meltdown. So I'm trying to paint a picture of a very intense day. And then from there, we can talk about the, you know, get kicked out of the system and then go to the thing and then getting kidnapped and then, you know, that part. So I feel like I'm uh, kind of setting this, this stage, so to speak. And uh, how about you, Kate? Where, if you had to write 
uh, right after our show, where in the storyline do you think you would try and pick up? Yeah, I still want to. I still want to write his um, his rescue scene where he gets rescued and the introduction of uh, the new culture. I think is where I'm going to keep taking off. Um, but you know what I'm really excited to write about is I, I, I think we called it two different things. So we got to figure out what we're going to call it, the edge of the fringe. I'm really excited to write that scene where he sees it firsthand for the first time. Right. And I think we talked about his grandma ended up there in her last years because she like left the system essentially. Um, and like just this epiphany. This, like so he actually gets inundated in two cultures he gets inundated in the culture that shows connection and then he gets sent back to the edge before he can get in back into the system and he gets and he sees what's out there right he sees this sub like whole other world of business of opportunity of of people living a completely different way that he was blind to before it was like this other thing in his own world right so I, I'm curious to explore that scene as well, what that looks like, that kind of that um, very post-apocalyptic sub-community that has happened. Hmm. Yeah, very interesting. No, I'm, I'm excited. So, um, uh, Adam, do you think you could, um, you know, when, when you get a little better, but <laughs> do you think you could uh, record another one of those voiceovers? Sure. Um, yeah, a voiceover with the with the idea of what's going on with the 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 scariness of of the healthcare and this this separation. Okay, uh, you know I have my suspicions of, about like how much of this is political and how much of it is. Um, I know it's very science based, but. Um, this, the, the reality in our culture is that funding for public hospitals actually has, uh, you know, falls more on one side of a political divide than in others. Uh, it's, it's not pro-business, it's not pro-market, it's not these types of things. It comes from public funding. Mm -hmm. And so... One thing, you know, in our situation that I feel very, it, it feels very ironic to me, uh, but very telling, in fact, is we can get frustrated with the current state of uh, our partners to the south of the border, but their very um, individualistic culture. And if you don't have health care, if you don't have those types of things, then that's on you as an individual. So. The epiphany that I've had as, uh, as of late is that really, yeah. is there any surprise that, you know, the, the, that, that the country would basically move against uh, the organizations of hospitals and, uh, uh, you know, uh, healthcare to basically shut down economies, right? Like, it, it, it just isn't there. It's not valued the same way in, in society as it is. Mm -hmm. In Canada, we're not quite, but we're still very individualistic, right? And um, yeah, I just, I just don't know if there's a, you know, there's a surprise there. Yeah, I honestly, I don't know. I, I feel as though there's an interesting commentary here. You know, we we are in a time of accelerated change for a lot of different things, so. Yeah. You know, I, I kind of imagine right now being what it must have been like to live in the 60s, you know, uh, just you know, every time I turn on the news, it's something different. It's this, that, the other thing, you know, never mind the technological change and what's happening with business and cryptocurrency and, you know, politics, and all, all this kind of sensationalism and all this sort of stuff. So, you know, I wonder if we're going to come out of it in five, 10 years after our heads stop spinning. Wow, that was a great time. You know, the twenties were just nuts. <laughs> you know, I definitely think that it's bringing to light some very rooted issues in both healthcare systems. Like you have our southern 
brothers and sisters down there who it's individualistic and they have to pay for it, but their healthcare caters to a customer experience as well because the customer pays, right? Versus, um, you know, I have a friend who's a nurse and she, she's an amazing nurse. She did so much, like she's just phenomenal nurse in the hospital and she decided she couldn't handle the the stresses and the way that the system is going and the pay cuts they were asking for and all this stuff that they were doing like all of this and so she went casual they lost a full-time nurse and their response from administration was okay yep that's fine there was no oh really we're really upset like we value you, nothing, nothing, no attempt to retain. It was all just, okay, next. And then, you know, she wanted to say no to some more time. And they said, no, 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 sorry, we have a resourcing issue. Well, of course you have a resourcing issue. You don't care about your people. <laughs> you know, and not to mention the fact that, you know, there's no feedback loop from the actual end user. Like I go and I use the hospital. My feedback is that you have to stay in your house. Right? Yeah. Yeah, that's so, very interesting. You know, like, I, I struggle. I struggle because I went through it where it was like, man, I had an, uh, a health issue, you know, with my, my daughter when she was born. And to be able to have health care, like, that surgery having to pay for would have crippled us as a family to have to get a bill after going through all that it was already a high expense because we couldn't work and we had to all these additional expenses and travel and like all this piece that we weren't anticipating then on top of it to get a hospital bill that would have been detrimental so like i have this strong struggle but there's something needs to be fixed do you know what i mean and i i just i really wonder where this whole situation we're in currently is going to take us because it's bringing to highlight a whole bunch of really issues that people are going to tolerate for much longer. I don't think. Hmm. Yeah. What is the vote? Who do you vote for? Which party has the right answer? That's what I mean. You don't even know what party to vote for. Well, well they're, all <laughs> they're all wrong. That's the problem. They're all wrong. Mm. And that's where it's interesting because healthcare in our book has now become outsourced like to another galaxy, right? Yep. And the government just says like you're covered as long as you behave, right? As long as you do these things, you're covered. But as soon as you have too many infractions, we're not covering you. Like, go, it's private now. It's all you, buddy, <laughs> right? But it's a totally different concept, right? And so, um, yeah, it's it's really interesting how I, I have strong opinions, I guess, about the healthcare system. <laughs> well, you know what, what? What could be interesting here is, you know, if you say, for example, we talked about Quebec to say we're going to sanction you for not getting immunized. But then you're okay with people smoking like a chimney and drinking like a fish. <laughs> like, you know what's what's worse. So, uh, you know, there's, well, and at what a, point do we stop? At what point do we like track all of our decisions? Right, like we track all of our health decisions. Our our you know we got our Fitbits on, we've got whatever. We're tracking. We're pulling all that data. At what point does the government say? Sorry, your taxes went up because you made some really poor decisions. We traced your alcohol blood level on an average day. We traced your your breathing and your oxygen levels and all this stuff. You're not taking care of yourself. We know you're going to be a, a drain on the system and tax accordingly. Where does it? I don't know. You know, it's crazy. It's crazy to think that this could. We're not far from that kind of capability. Hmm. You know, it makes me think about the concept of libertarian. You guys both know what that means, right? No. Okay, so uh, libertarian is, it's like a, 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 it emerges from Ayn Rand, basically, that says, 
the very minimal government intervention period and it, and 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 i i want to tie this back into star trek hey okay? I'm, I'm hoping to kind of jazz you up a little bit you know yeah. adam's dragging a little bit here he has the right to be the poor guy he's <laughs> suffering a bit but you know what here's the thing remember in star trek where there's a first principle or like the golden rule or something like this but you do not go yeah. in and interfere in other civilizations you do not go into other cultures you don't yeah, interfere and let them the prime directive right yeah. so you you, yeah. you keep your nose out of it okay mm -hmm. and you would be surprised how much of a parallel that is between a liberal government uh top down approach to a lot of policies. Now there's a lot of people that'll come and say, this is a problem, they need this, they need more funding, we need to have a system, this and, and, and basically the libertarian says, as minimal as possible, because you don't really understand that once you start doing that, how things will kind of snowball and how things are bad and how things are, so there's a lot of uh, fundamental philosophy in the United States that's really, really based off of this Anne Randian, like minimal government, right? Just keep out of our business. Give us the maximum amount of freedom. And I think that's something that, um, you know, I'm, like, I'm hoping to see a fresh take on that with you guys, because it's really the root of, of uh, the concerns here. Um, if I were to say to somebody, okay, uh, you know, we all have kids. At what point do we do the proverbial, you know, push, you know, metaphorically push them from the tree and say, you can get a job, you're good, you know how to do this, you know? And we have to balance in our head to say, you got to take personal responsibility. <gasps> My kid's five, I've already started. I don't know if that's true. <laughs> She's already got a job. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> He's like, Mom, I want a quad because he got to ride on his, we call him Bob. That's my dad. He got to ride on his quad. Mom, I want a quad. Here's a jar. There's two ways you can earn money in this world. You work hard and you study hard. Pick what you want to do. I'll compensate you for both. So now he does chores or reads to put money in the jar. He's like, do I have enough? I'm like, two years. Be two years. Like you got to save for two years. <laughs> good for you, Kate. That's really good. And I like how it's not a swear jar, although you might have a swear jar, but I like that, right? <laughs> There's two ways to earn money in this world. You have to study yeah, or you have to, I love that. That's really good. Well, well, now he knows. With, there you go. Only through struggle comes growth, right? So, and you know, it's interesting. I'm reading, um, an interesting book on the psychology of happiness and it talks about people aren't happy unless they struggle they, they have to struggle because it engages your innate brain's defense systems to um the example is after birth women look back and they're like oh it wasn't that bad because your brain you just went through a struggle your brain will paint it in a rosier picture so you'll, you'll feel better about it so i don't know it's very are interesting or people are happier if you're given less choice or things of this nature I don't know, it's really neat so i right. think we want this actually we're happier if we did that <laughs> so we think we don't want to struggle that we don't want to fight for it that we should get funding from the government that this that and the other thing but ultimately you know does that actually lead to growth happiness that type of thing a better society yeah absolutely right. i think that's where do we draw the line i mean i think there's there's arguments out there that that say you know certain families certain kin based uh accumulations of wealth happen where you know a child won't have to do a bloody thing because they've they've been born into that right and, you know, there's other families where, you know, children are just at complete disadvantage, no matter how much they work, they're still going to have to suffer just to, just to keep their head above the water, just to breathe. Right. We would have to have, we'd have to have a huge distribution of wealth for that to even become a problem. Like 
1% of the population has 90, over 90% of the wealth. Okay. Yeah. So like in order for that to even become an issue, we're going to have to have a huge, huge distri- like redistribution of funds in the world. Right. Yeah. Like, Very good point. We're, we're all fighting. We're all fighting. This 1% who lives in this other world, we look at them, we watch them, right? Yeah, that's why that's why it feels like it's so close into reach because it's oh, get to see them. Yeah, but the majority of people just don't have that. You know, middle class. Everybody in middle class is uh, fighting. It's a battle in a way, right? Like they're trying mm-hmm. to move yeah. things forward. They're trying to, uh, you know, ascend. And yeah, yeah. But we're, we're all trying to be that one percent. We're all tra- trying to be that one percent, right? But there's this new epiphany and this this new realization this is what's the whole great resignation down in the u.s is i don't need it we have been over inundated with consumerism and it's still this whole like consumerism life but people have learned that i would rather make less with more meaning behind it right i want purpose i want to be valued I would rather take a pay cut and be valued, right? And live within a certain means. So people are starting to realize that they don't see it. We don't have to be the 1% anymore. You don't have to. What do you want? Like, I just had a sales guy. He's like, oh my gosh, your packages are way too cheap, right? And I was like, he's like, we should talk about how you should raise your prices. And I'm like, I don't want to raise my prices. And he's like, yeah, but you could make more money. And I'm like, it is not about money. It's about having an impact, being accessible so that we can do more good, that we can actually lift people up and lift businesses up to do their vision, to, to change the world. And he's like, yeah, but I, I really think you could make more money. I'm like, I don't know how to explain this to you. <laughs> yeah. Right. And so there is this, there's this whole thing happening right now of businesses that it's profit because you have to stay alive, but it's profit through purpose. Mm. Right. There's this whole movement now of, I don't have to be the 1%. I don't need the Lamborghini. In fact, if I had money, I don't think I would buy buy one, you know, my son might ask for a quad, but <laughs> you know. So I, I think that the struggle. Once people reach a certain point, I think I think you're going to see a change. Like we're not all going to try to be that one percent. Maybe. I, I, I completely agree with you because I I, I follow the same model. Uh, you know, I've I've really embraced a concept of co-creating, realizing that I show up to the table and I say. It's not me doing the service for you. We've got together a problem. How are we going to solve the problem? And what are you going to do? And what am I going to do? Um, you know, and and then it's priced accordingly. Uh, and and you know, because without that buy-in, you know, you, you could say that that there's some struggle from the client too to figure out and go through. Uh, you know, the the, the, uh, the act of actually writing a book. This is meant as a a, a struggle you have to you know you have to struggle through this to figure out good writing will uh indelibly will just you know require a a struggle from from both of you uh you know for that final product that we have down on the right hand corner for you guys to actually hold that copy in your hand and say we did it and i'm confident enough to give this to somebody else to actually read Right. I mean, I know you guys have high standards, not the highest and like not unrealistic, but there's something that it means to put, you know, the, you know, your name on it. Yeah. Well, and I, I guess I, I love that. Right. Like Caitlin and I decided we could write a textbook, and just like talk business ad, community risk analysis. But I feel like that is something. You know, in between meetings, if I had 20 minutes, I could sit down and write that, no problem. Turn it on, turn it off, whatever. This, this I have to, like, emotionally delve into, right? It takes kind of a piece of my soul to kind of pour into it to describe a world, to describe a character, blah, 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 blah. So, like, the cost is much higher, but the rewards will be, I think, better. Even if nobody reads it, I think we 
talk about this book. In fact, like you said, I can hold it in my hand and say, I love this book. This is great. <laughs> right? That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. So. And and that that was our very first start. Like we're writing something to be proud of. And it's not about sales. It's not about like we want to be proud of this story. We wanna we wanna read it ourselves and be like, yeah. Right. And if that's it, if it's like Adam's mom buys a copy and my mom buys a copy (laughs) and that is it. But we're super proud. Like we're winning. But you'll still give it to your you because you guys run an engineering company and a marketing company and blah, blah, blah. Right. So you guys still give it to clients like you're going to be like, this is we had a great this is out of the box. This is fun. This was right. Like, like, yeah, come on this journey. Why not? Right. Well, there's there's something that, you know, I have to plug here for the iterative publish model, because you can take something like this. And, and I, I think I brought up this before. Barnes and Noble offers a personal copy that's fully like uh, full um, like cover art and everything. So, you know, you don't have to order 100 or 10,000 copies or anything like this. You could actually order them one at a time and even sign them one at a time and give them out in that in that in that way yep um and uh i've used the process it's just it's just it's so good it's great yeah you know it works really well so um okay, on so that I've, note, I've got i've got one last thing yep. i have i don't know adam if you saw that i did this because i would love to we are doing this like we are super jazzed i have booked two hours because you have to get at least two hours to get into flow state two hours every other week for just writing in our calendars oh, I like that. so it's happening it's booked because if it doesn't get booked into our calendars i don't know it, it doesn't, it doesn't get happen so well, i was actually thinking about um taking like full days picking a Friday just be like don't bother me <laughs> like I, uh, you know like that's the only way it's going to get done that we've we've gone through we've experienced trying to do it um, you know in in the in the whirlwind and I, it's not a matter of time it's a matter of priority uh, you know so uh, I, you know call it a new year's resolution or whatever but uh, seems to move. Caitlin and I never start something that we don't finish. So right. uh, it's, it's happening. So I don't mean think, it's not like we haven't we haven't just done anything. We've written, but we want I think we want to move faster. We want to move faster. Yeah. Yeah. Think of it as a flywheel. Like for me for writing it, it's like it has to get spinning like really fast. Yeah. And then then mm-hmm. the paper, you know, the writing starts happening. Um, both uh, Kate's idea of blocking out time and Adam's idea of, of blocking out a full day are great. I want Kate to comment on one more thing about the minimum of two hours for flow state. That was interesting. I don't know that about that, and I want to know about that. But the other, th- but the, the before I want to leave one comment with with Adam, and then I want Kate to talk about flow state, and then that's a wrap. Adam, uh, the full day is great, and I almost wonder if I can challenge you both for this. There's a, a a detaching from technology that happens in your book, throughout your book, right? What I challenge you to do, uh, as long as it works with your writing, is to say, Adam, when you're sitting down on that Friday, I want you to be able to say, there's no way an email can hit me. There's no way something from the outside can actually come in. I'm really curious if you could actually set up that those barriers. Okay, that's Is interesting. It, if, if, if it's even possible, you'd have to actually set up your workspace in a way where there's there's no nothing can come in. And I know from a writing creative sort of standpoint that if if I start in the morning with a fresh mind, it's a cup of coffee, it's sitting there. Sometimes being in front of a, I sometimes write better being out on a a park bench out somewhere not in calgary cold but (laughs) you know like (laughs) and i'm sitting there i could be in a in a in in an airport and i'm like there's nothing to do here except there's you know just right i can't answer an email i can't respond i can't i can't do it there's nothing there's no way for people to get in touch with me 
and we'll just cross our fingers. There's no completely optional to you, Adam. Uh, but Kate, can you please give us a little few sentences about enlightenment of a flow state and why it requires a, a minimum of two hours to, to get that going? So um, I, I read it somewhere. Maybe the book Limitless. Can't remember where I read it, but I read it. Um, anyway, so for those who have ever entered a flow state, it's the ability to hyperfocus. So ADHD people have this um, superpower and they can access it really fast and really intensely. Um, the average mindset needs needs a little bit more time to enter flow state. Have you ever talk to an ADHD person and you're right there and then they're like, pardon, what'd you say? Because you didn't have their full attention. That's because like they're probably hyper-focused on something. So um, flow state is where you can actually like your productivity goes through the roof. So if you enter into a flow state, you're literally, and you've probably done it in your life where it's like, it just comes, it's, it's flowing out of you. You're going like crazy and you're getting strides and it's not, it's not effort. It's almost like you're in this trance of production, right? And it just, it is like, nothing can distract you. You're in flow. You go, oh my God, I totally didn't realize the time has gone by, right? You're in another world. So ADHD minds are, are predisposed to access this really fast and, and easy. But in order to, to hit any sort of level of flow, you need to block out those two hours, distractions, limit them, like that kind of stuff, in order for you to get to that state. Everybody can get to it. It takes practice. Um, me, myself, being ADHD, Mom. hi, honey. honey, I can access it, Mom. but I got to block out the time. You heard it here, guys. That's the flow state. And, uh, you know, Adam and Kate have their, uh, you know, their work agendas. And we've got a special guest who's, uh, why don't we all wave goodbye? Can you wave? Bye. Can we get a wave? <laughs> there we go. Okay. Thanks, guys. Till next time.